Philadelphia was one of the biggest industrial cities in not only the country, but the world. It became more crowded with the living, more people were dying. There wasn't a lot of room left to bury the dead. Where do you go? Laurel Hill was the second major rural cemetery in the country. America in general was very intrigued and very interested in this idea of a rural cemetery. These were the precursors of parks. The newspapers in the entire country were writing about Laurel Hill Cemetery. It's stunning. You just don't see a place like this starting from scratch these days. So it pulls at that historic feeling. There are titans of industry and famous people buried here. This is where the richest of the rich in Philadelphia bought their property. As a marketing scheme, we were reburying celebrities, bringing them to the cemetery. It's a business. It got so popular so quick that eventually they had to limit how often tourists were coming to Laurel Hill. We have connections to pretty much every aspect of Philadelphia. Pick a topic, we can probably come up with at least two or three different individuals that are connected to that topic. There's a lot of mysteries in the cemetery and a lot of secrets, and it's fun to think about that. Laurel Hill Cemetery was founded as the second major rural cemetery in the United States in 1836. America was rapidly becoming an industrialized society. Population was growing. The city was becoming very dense. Buildings were being torn down for factories. Philadelphia was one of the biggest industrial cities in not only the country, but the world. As more people started moving into the city, it became more crowded with the living, more people were dying. Your only options for burial were privately owned church burying grounds. So where do you go when these small churchyards are filled up? The United States followed a trend that occurred over in Europe first. Many of the larger cities in Europe were finding that they were running out of space to bury their dead. So they started looking outside the city limits. While they were looking outside the city limits, they thought, let's create a place that is beautiful. And that is why rural cemeteries came around. This was in 1835. The first rural cemetery in the country was Mount Auburn in Cambridge, Massachusetts. John J. Smith was one of the founders of Laurel Hill, but he had a very personal interest. He had a daughter who died in 1835 and was buried in Center City in a small Quaker meeting house. He tried to go back to the grave, but the burial ground was so overcrowded with burials and it wasn't very well kept. He couldn't find the grave, it was waterlogged. And he thought that everybody deserved a respectful and dignified burial place. And it should be a more positive experience for the loved ones visiting. John G. Smith was a jack of all trades. He was librarian of the library company. He was the editor of a magazine called The Horticulturist. He began looking for land outside of the city limits. So he gathered many other civic-minded leaders, three of whom took the lead. One was a former mayor, Benjamin Richardson, financial businessman who was Nathaniel Dunn, and druggist at the time, Frederick Brown and the four of them began looking for property outside of the city. John J. Smith wanted a site that was of enormous beauty and had great topography and a place where people would want to come and would want to be buried and to see their loved ones. They found some acreage along the Schuylkill River and they purchased the first acres here at Laurel Hill Cemetery in 1836. They came three and a half miles outside of Center City. Nathan Dunn was the purse strings of this whole adventure. He put up the money to buy the plot of land North Laurel Hill first. They made that money back almost immediately. In their first couple of months of selling property, they were making tens of thousands of dollars in lot sales. This was where there was fresh air, beautiful views, lovely gardens, water. Who wouldn't want to be here? You could spread your loved ones out. You could have monumentation, elaborate headstones, elaborate mausolea. There was a competition to design Laurel Hill and John Notman was a young Scotsman. He had never done a major piece of architecture before. Parks didn't exist back in 1835. Municipal parks, art museums didn't, outdoor sculpture didn't. 
but in a rural cemetery outside of the city limits, you could have all of that. He kept in mind old medieval gardens from England when he was laying out the winding paths. The idea was you would come out here for a stroll and you weren't just going to go up and down a grid you were supposed to stroll around. If you are living in Center City, Philadelphia, it's industrial, it's crowded. If you want to take in the air or see green space, a rural cemetery was really the only place that you could do that. People would go to great lengths to get out here. They would take trains, they would take horse-drawn carriages, or they would come by steamboat up the Schuylkill River. They were parks. They were the precursors of the park systems that we have today in major cities. People would pack their picnic baskets and spend a nice afternoon with the family. They would stroll around the grounds. They would have fresh air. They would escape the diseases of the city and enjoy themselves. Almost every cemetery had a receiving vault or an area that they could store bodies until the ground was ready to be dug. Everything is done by hand. So during the winter, when most of the ground is frozen, people are still dying. So you need to put them somewhere until the ground can be dug. It was temporary storage. Receiving vaults contained individual crypts that could be rented monthly, $5 a month for a crypt. Then in the spring, when you are able to dig a grave, then you would do the official burial. From day one, this was a non-denominational cemetery. Anyone could be buried here if they could pay. It was a more expensive cemetery, 50 cents a square foot. The founders didn't have paupers in mind. It's a business, and the people that started it, and John J. Smith, were business people, and they had to make money, and they were very savvy marketing folks. He encouraged people to be reinterred here famous people. The country was young. The Revolutionary War, we're coming off the heels of that. The big heavy hitters in the war and the early founding of America are the celebrities that were brought here. So we have General Mercer who fought along George Washington and actually took a bayonet to protect our president. He was reinterred here and if it was good enough for General Mercer, it surely would be good enough for my loved one. He really convinced people and wanted to make this the most beautiful spot and a spot where you would want to be because other people were here that were well known. The victor of Gettysburg is buried here. General George Gordon Meade was the general for the Union Army during the Battle of Gettysburg. We have connections to pretty much every aspect of Philadelphia. Pick a topic, we can probably come up with at least two or three different individuals that are connected to that topic. If you're from Philadelphia, you have probably passed a building designed by Frank Furness. The Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts was designed by Furness. The gatehouse at the Philadelphia Zoo was designed by him. One certainly everyone has heard of when they were a child singing the song, Mary Had a Little Lamb. The woman who wrote Mary Had a Little Lamb is buried here. Her name is Sarah Josepha Hale. She also has another claim to fame. She petitioned to several US presidents to get Thanksgiving to be a national holiday. Someone who's not buried here, but still very famous is Adrian Balboa. In 2006, Sylvester Stallone came out to Laurel Hill Cemetery and filmed Rocky Balboa. And since any time the franchise has had him visit her grave, which was in Creed 1 and in Creed 2, we use the same prop headstone. David Rittenhouse is here. Anybody from Philadelphia has probably strolled around Rittenhouse Square. That was named for him. He was another one of those big names in early colonial American history. A lot of people claim that Robert Cornelius was the first person to take a selfie and his grave is here and on his grave is a ceramic portrait of that portrait. Henry Charles Lee was a historian and he is most known for his books on the Spanish Inquisition and witchcraft. He not only had great subject matter in his life but his monument here at Laurel Hill Cemetery is Cleo the muse of history, which is very appropriate for a historian. They knew that to attract 
people out to their new cemetery, they had to come up with new ways of doing things. For example, built the old mortality structure. Back in the 1830s, 1840s, there was no public sculpture. There was not an art museum. This was a newfangled thing. We're at the sculptural group known as Old Mortality and His Pony. And we have Old Mortality on a headstone and his pony, and they're chatting with Sir Walter Scott, the author of this tale. The idea of Old Mortality and his pony is that Old Mortality went through Scotland to engrave the headstones of Presbyterian Scots who are being persecuted. And so he was engraving their names on the headstones to ensure that they were remembered. People would flock. They would come out here just to see the sculpture. Millionaire's Row is where many of the wealthy titans of industry are buried, and there are very large mausoleums along Millionaire's Row, which overlooks the Schuylkill River. You will see why it gets its name, Millionaire's Row, because here the best, the biggest monuments and mausolea are here. This mausoleum is the largest in the entire cemetery. It belonged to Henry Diston and his family. Henry Diston founded the saw works of Tacony, Philadelphia, and he developed a flexible yet strong saw that was better than any saw in the United States. And you can see what saw money will get you. This mausoleum was built in 1878, and at the time it cost about half a million dollars. We are here at the Berwind family plot the Berwins made their money in the coal industry, but what makes them so famous today and a hot spot here at Laurel Hill Cemetery is their beautiful monument. The monument is called Aspiration, and it was carved by a woman sculptor named Harriet Frischmuth, and it is one of our most visited monuments. The Warner family plot here at Laurel Hill Cemetery is also one of our most visited family plots because of its art. Behind me is a sculpture that was done by famed Philadelphia sculptor Alexander Milne Calder. If you take a look at this woman's face, some say you can see the same face that you see on top of City Hall, which is that of William Penn, because Alexander Milne Calder did both of the statues. The woman here is next to a coffin with a raised lid, and the spirit of William Warner is coming out of the coffin. Even though there are titans of industry and famous people buried here, the first burial actually occurred before the cemetery was ready to open. On October 21st, 1836, Mercy Carlisle was just your everyday run-of-the-mill woman. She doesn't have a grand story. They wouldn't start selling property to the rest of the world until December of that year. So while the rich and elite of Philadelphia were certainly buying plots here, everyone else was too. America in general was very intrigued and very interested in this idea of a rural cemetery. Newspapers in the entire country were writing about Laurel Hill Cemetery. It got so popular so quick that eventually they had to limit how often tourists were coming to Laurel Hill. This was still an active cemetery. There were families here who were mourning, who were grieving. There was a little bit of a clash between lot owners and the people who were out here for recreational purposes. So what they did was they instituted a ticketing system. When you bought a lot here at Laurel Hill Cemetery, you would get a proprietor's ticket. And that ticket you would show when you came here on Sundays. Sundays were the days set aside where you were not getting into Laurel Hill unless you had a proprietor's ticket. Laurel Hill Cemetery really quickly learned that they were becoming landlocked by the creation of Fairmount Park. There was only so much space, there was westward expansion in the United States. People are leaving the cities, families aren't using these plots as much as they would have in the past. National trends with cemeteries were moving away from the rural cemetery movement into a much more open rolling landscape. So Tastes changed. In 1869, John J. Smith went west of the river and purchased West Laurel Hill, which at the time was even farther outside of Philadelphia and more rural at the time. That's when the cemetery itself started their period of being degraded and unkempt, derelict. It was overgrown, and then there were a lot of headstones that 
had fallen over. So families lost interest. They saw this not as a beautiful place to be buried anymore. And it costs a lot of money to keep the cemetery going and to pay for the resetting of the stones and care of the monuments. And that was really the impetus of the Friends. We were established in 1978 to bring in fundraising to protect, preserve, and promote Laurel Hill and West Laurel Hill cemeteries. We do programming, we apply for grants. Started with a gentleman named John Francis Marion. That absolutely thought this place is one of the best civic institutions in the country and we just have to do whatever we can do to preserve it and protect it. He was aware of all of the notable individuals buried here and the specialness of Laurel Hill Cemetery. He started giving tours of the cemetery and then that slowly grew and we to this day do tours throughout the entire year of the cemeteries. We also do programming such as concerts in the cemetery as well as showing movies. These events are really important because the funds that come in through those events, they go to supporting the friends and thus to the mission of protecting, promoting, preserving, and educating the public about the importance of our cemeteries as historic cultural institutions. We are a lot of different things. We're an accredited arboretum. We are a sculpture garden. We have all the stories of the histories of our residents. And if we're not talking about them, those things are lost lost to the ages. So we love being the space where all those different interests combine. In April, 2009, when sports announcer Harry Callis passed away, his family wanted to bury him somewhere in Philadelphia that had significance to the city. When Harry Callis's family chose to have him buried here, that brought the celebrity notoriety back to Laurel Hill. It was kind of touching on what John J. Smith was doing in the very beginning with bringing celebrity burials here. Even though it's more than 10 years after his death, we still get people who come into the gatehouse specifically looking for Harry Callis. We get a lot of comments and questions. They think that it is taboo or not appropriate to have the types of events that we have at the cemetery, but it does go back to that rural cemetery ethos. Cemeteries were originally used not only to bury your loved ones, but were very, very much recreational areas. And we've come full circle and we're back to that today. And Laurel Hill embraces that. 